learning models would give us um, useful sort of outcomes. Um, zero knowledge cryptography uh, essentially gives us two main properties. One is uh, the verifiability of execution, which stem from the cryptographic properties of completeness and soundness. And the second part is essentially hiding parts of uh, the computation that you're performing without sacrificing this sort of verifiability. Um, when we're talking about ZKML, uh, we're usually talking about um, proof of inference. We're creating a proof that a model has been evaluated on some input and that it indeed created some output. And we can verify this entire process cryptographically. Uh, we can see sort of like a, a, a simple schema over here where um, this is sort of like the inference um, step where you have some input, you feed it into some model, and uh, out you have an output, and you're able to sort of create a zero knowledge proof of this entire process. Why do we create only zero knowledge proofs of, uh, let's say, inference and not training? Um, so, training in and of itself is already extremely computationally intensive because you need to run it on co located data centers and, uh, like, essentially, like, let's say, like AWS or Google Cloud or, or like these huge distributed computers that like, are working and like training for months on end. It's uh, millions of dollars um, that's spent on hardware and electricity and ma maintaining all this infrastructure just to train a model. And zero knowledge cryptography, if you're proving a computation inside of zero knowledge, it creates a lot of computational overhead in the order of like, let's say, 100 to 1,000 x. Right, so it, it's about 100x as uh, computationally more expensive to create a zero knowledge proof than perform the um, computation itself. So if you want to do zero knowledge training, prepare to be training a model for, let's say, decades um, in order to actually create a proof for that training. Um, so that's why we are sort of talking about proof of inference, because um, when the model is already trained, it's just running a few linear combinations and a few like matrix multiplications, and you'd be able to create a proof within that uh, a lot more easily than with training. So um, here I'm going to talk a little bit about like different primitives and how you can combine them sort of to sort of give zero knowledge machine learning, so to sort of create a good uh, intuition for what we're trying to do. Um, so on the left side, we see privacy and computational integrity. Uh, if you combine these properties, you get what you would call zero knowledge cryptography. If you uh, combine uh, privacy and heuristic optimization, so heuristic optimization, essentially what you can think of it as is sort of like an algorithm that's able to give you a good enough approximation to a good problem that you're trying to solve. Um, in the context of ML, to give a good example, you can, for example, have a model that classifies an image as a dog or a cat. And this model has some accuracy on some data that you test it with, right? It can have like 90, 99%, 99.1, whatever, right? So like this is sort of like a heuristic. And if you're trying to sort of optimize this problem, that's what you'd call like heuristic optimization. So this, this heuristic optimization thing step just, um, you can think of it as just like ML pretty much. And if you want to, for example, have like private ML, you could use something like fully homomorphic encryption. Um, fully homomorphic encryption is a type of cryptography that allows you to uh, encrypt an input, perform some operations on some encrypted input, then you have an output that's encrypted, and then when you decrypt the output, it will have that operation performed on top of it. So you're able to have data privacy. Uh, if you combine uh, ML with computational integrity, you get validity ML. Right? So you only get this proof that some computation happened correctly, but you ha you're, you're not hiding any of the computational steps. Uh, and if you combine it all, right, like if you get privacy and heuristic optimization and computational integrity, it's sort of like what we would call zero knowledge machine learning. Also, one note that I'd like to point out is that the difference between privacy in terms of ZK and the privacy in terms of fully homomorphic encryption is different because fully homomorphic encryption allows you to have a private data, whereas uh, if you're doing a zero knowledge uh, ML, the data is not private. It will always be available to the prover, but the prover will be able to perform some computations and prove that those computations happened without revealing the computation. But it will always have access to that private information. Uh, so that's like an important, important step to note. Um, yeah, so this is just uh, repeating a little bit of what I said before. You have like more standardized definitions of what they mean. And uh, I'll also talk a little bit about like the difference between zero knowledge and validity um, proofs. Uh, in, our, in our space, many people are sort of um, con conflating the two concepts, right? So for example, when people talk about zero knowledge rollups, they're not really talking about zero knowledge rollups. 
um, they're talking about validity rollups, like creating proofs that some state transition happened correctly, but you're not hiding parts of that state transition, right? Like things Starknet, Scroll, uh, or any other ZK rollup, um, right? If you're actually hiding so set computation, think like Aztec, right? Like where you're having some like private transfers where you don't see balances or things Zcash, that's actually zero knowledge cryptography, not um, not validity. Where like uh, validity, you're essentially doing a zero knowledge proof without hiding any computation. Right, so like when you're talking about validity ML, it's just not hiding any computation, but actually proving that it happened. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about the current state of the art uh, of what we are able to do with zero knowledge machine learning in terms of like the technology and how far it is along. Um, so um, zero knowledge machine learning is at its infancy. Um, it's just like currently like zero knowledge proving systems have become mature enough that people have started exploring, sort of creating proofs of more, more computationally intensive operations. Uh, such as like machine learning models, right? So it's in a very early, early R and D phase. Research is, is is like there's a bunch of papers that have come out in, in the past few years. Uh, there's a few tools that have tried uh, that, that have come out, like better, more easier, like zk proving systems and better APIs for these. So you're able to create actually like proofs of more more complex operations. And so here I'll mention my friends from Modulus Labs who are sitting in the front row. Um, they recently released a paper called, called The Cost of Intelligence, where they tried to benchmark uh, different proving systems uh, against uh, different sized models. And um, so here I'll give you an example from their paper uh, of what you can actually do nowadays. Uh, you're able to prove a model of about 18 million parameters in size in about 50 seconds running on a powerful machine on AWS. By powerful, I mean 64 cores and 192 gigs of RAM. So it's a really huge machine. And um, they used, uh, for, for this specific one, they used the Planck E2 proving system built by the Polygon Zero team. So now I'll show you sort of like a graph of uh, comparing like all these different proving systems. Um, for the ones that are interested in the, in the list, there's Gemini, Gross 16, Halo 2, Planck E2, Winterfell, and uh, a prover that was custom built by a paper, in, in, within a paper called ZKCNN. And on the x-axis, you can see the number of parameters. And on the y-axis, you can see how long it took to create a proof given uh, a, a proving system for that specific model. Right? So on the, 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 the one that's on the lowest, that's like orange, dark orange, um, is the one with Planky 2 that I just mentioned earlier, the, la the very last dot on the right, on the bottom right. So I'll talk a little bit about the tooling and like the state of the art, like what you can actually use today. Um, so this tool, as the first one that I mentioned, is Ezekiel. Um, so by the way, like these names are just the what you the, the slug that you have on GitHub. Just like if you go to GitHub.com/slash Ezekiel, that's like the actual tool, so you can use it. Um, so Ezekiel is a tool that allows you to create proofs of ONNX computational graphs. ONNX is this like standardized format that you can use to export machine learning models from different frameworks. So if you're an ML engineer, let's say you use PyTorch or Keras or TensorFlow, you're able to take um, a model that you have within your framework, export it to ONNX, and then feed it into Ezekiel and create a proof that that actually happened correctly. Um, Ezekiel is using a fork from uh, Halo 2's proving system. Um, that was created by the Privacy Scaling Explorations Group by the Ethereum Foundation. And they're working on an easy to use API for developers so that if you're an ML engineer, you can easily prove um, these computations. Uh, another um, tool is uh, Circumlib ML, who was built by Dr. Kathy So. Um, so she, she built sort of this library that allows you to sort of create a model. Um, with different layers uh, using the CIRCOM uh, domain specific language, which was originally built by the IDEN3 team. Right? So if you want to build a, a simple model, you can use CIRCOM for it, you can use that one. And if you have uh, a Keras model, uh, you can use Keras to CIRCOM, which is just a transpiler that allows you to just convert any Keras model to a CIRCOM representation and then create a proof of it. Um, another uh, good mention is uh, Tachikoma from the Linear A team. I just use the ZKML uh, handle because that's the one that they have on GitHub, but the team is called Linear A. And it's essentially similar to Ezekiel, where they're trying to create a proof of inference of some model in a standardized way. Uh, of course, it's early days. Um, more people are looking into ZKML. More people are trying to explore with its primitive, what they're able to do with it. And so more, more teams are building out different tools. And I'm sure that like, in the next coming months and years, like, the, the state of the art will improve severely. And so now I'll talk about its use cases. Um, the reason why I put the use cases in the end is um, because sort of people um, 
I usually work it backwards. Um, I, I try to sort of work from the primitives that you have and then trying to combine these primitives to sort of think of useful use cases. And I also try to give some useful context about the, its current constraints so that you can sort of think of like what you can actually do, what you cannot do, to sort of like give you some limitations of what, what, what is possible today. So here I'll mention a few of them. Um, the, the use cases that only use validity proofs where you do not hide any part of the computation is, let's say, machine learning service providers, right? Like machine learning as a service. If you um, want to use a model but you don't have it locally on your train, like on, on, your, on, your, on your physical device, you can just, um, let's say, delegate it to OpenAI to run these models for you. And um, they're essentially, um, you, you, you as a user do not have any guarantee that they're actually running the correct model, right? Let's say that the newest model is GPT-4 and you want to use GPT-4, but instead they give you GPT-3 because it's easier to operate and you're not, you're not able to tell a difference. So in, in, in a possible future when you're able to create proofs of these large language models, for example, uh, you'd be able essentially to query an API and the API would have to give you a proof that they actually run the model that you want. Uh, and they would not be able to lie to you about the model they're running on the API, since it's a black box and you don't have, like, you, you're not able to see what they're actually running on their devices. Uh, another one is verifiable on-chain classifiers or regressors, right? So this is um, this is so that you're essentially able to verify um, the result of a machine learning algorithm on-chain without having to perform the um, computation on-chain, right? Like to perform a computation inside of a distributed system, like let's say Ethereum, is extremely expensive. Uh, and so essentially what you'd be able to do is run it locally, create a proof locally, and then you'd be able to put it on chain. Um, a few use cases of this could be, for example, creating a proof that, um, let's say that you want to predict the cost of like housing somewhere, right? So you have some inputs, which is like square meters, uh, where it is in the area, how many bathrooms, all these sorts of things. And uh, you'd be able to prove like to a new input um, that like this, this, this is like the actual result uh, to a smart contract, and then the smart contract could execute some logic based on the result of this machine learning model. Um, another one is anomaly detection or fraud prevention. So there's many models that are sort of uh, built to sort of detect anomalies or things that are not supposed to happen, or even like fraudulent transactions. Right? So you can train a model that runs on some on-chain activity, and if this model finds an anomaly or a fraud transaction and labels it, you can, for example, have a governance protocol that sort of determines that we can stop a protocol if we find some fraud. Right? And this is established as like a zero-knowledge proof of some uh, fraud, and like the, 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 the actual protocol will be able to stop if and only if you provided a proof that uh, some model that people have agreed upon is indeed find, uh, has indeed found some vulnerability. So you'd be able to automatically find, uh, st stop protocols if somebody finds an anomaly. Um, another one in terms of like more like zero knowledge where you're actually hiding computation, it's uh, for example like decentralized Kaggle. So for context, Kaggle is uh, a platform where you can do sort of competitions for trying to source the most, uh, the most uh, efficient model for a given task. So let's say you want to build a CAD doc classifier and you want to have the highest accuracy, you can submit a Kaggle competition and different people will compete to get sort of this, this, uh, this price that a person uh, set up for a competition. And if you win, then you get the price. However, this relies on a trusted party, which in this case is Kaggle. So the person running the competition gives money to Kaggle and then the person uh, running uh, or like applying for this competition uh, submits the model to Kaggle and once all of those parties agree, then Kaggle just like distributes the money to the person that won the competition and it gives the model to the person that created the competition. So instead you'd be able to make it decentralized in a way where a person would be able to create a zero knowledge proof of how accurate their model was without revealing what their model actually is. And then they would be able to automatically claim um, the, the, the reward based on submitting this proof um, to, to the party that created the, the competition. Another one that's useful is, for example, running inference on private or sensitive data. And you'd be able to essentially prove that, let's say that um, a classifier that's trying to find whether uh, a patient has cancer or not, you'd be able to prove with, with some accuracy that you ran some model on this sort of sensitive data, and you'd be able to hide uh, sort of this execution trace, and you'd be able to prove to either the patient or let's say like some insurance company or to like the actual medical expert that they, they, they ran some model and they actually classified the result in some way. Um, so me personally, I work at WorldCoin. We're building a privacy-preserving proof of personhood protocol. Um, I'll show you in a little bit later after the presentation if you want. I have the, the, the sort of like orb device um, that we have. It's, a, it's an iris scanner, essentially. And the way that we create a unique identifier is uh, running a machine learning model, right? 
However, if we ever uh, think of updating the machine learning model, then the people would have to go again to a hardware device and essentially get onboarded again. However, if you use zero knowledge machine learning, um, you'd be able to create a proof um, on their device, on their on their device, on their phone, that they indeed created this sort of identifier correctly without having to uh, sort of go to this physical device again. Um, also, we'd be able to make this sort of device uh, trustless in a way where you'd be able to prove um, sort of all of the all of the uh, fraud sort of or, or like civil attacks that you're trying to perform, whether it's like tampering with its firmware or tampering with its sensors, you'd be able to essentially prove that all of it, all of the de the device is running like the correct algorithms on it, and that it's actually checked for for every single thing in order so you cannot attack the the system. So this is like. These are like one of the few use cases that are most, most prominent, in my opinion. Uh, there's, of course, many more. Many people are thinking about what they could use these technologies for. And as there is better hardware, there is more optimized proving systems. And like, as, as in general, like the state of the art evolves, I'm sure that many more use cases will, will, will be available. Um, so where to learn more? Where can you find more about zero knowledge machine learning? So here I have three QR codes. Um, one is the zero knowledge machine learning community. It's essentially a Telegram group where um, I created like a group for m me and my friends originally that were interested in zero knowledge machine learning, and we've started like talking about the topic, right? Whether it's about like the state of the art in terms of like papers and the scientific side of it, or whether about implementation, some cryptography things, or just in general like hang out and talk about like cool, interesting things that we're trying to build. Uh, the middle one is called um, Awesome ZKML, which is a resource aggregator that I put out that, that I put it together essentially that has like a list of all the common like resources, uh, the, pap the scientific papers that talk about ZKML, the code bases that, that, that like mention ZKML or are trying to do ZKML related things, companies that are building in the area, and so on and so forth. And the third one is sort of um, um, like a pitch to a zero knowledge uh, hackathon that we're organizing in Lisbon. It's called ZK Hack Lisbon. It's an in person hackathon that starts on the 31st of March, ends on the 2nd of April, and essentially a hackathon for any builders that are interested in zero knowledge cryptography. And there'll be many people building with ZKML primitives as well. Uh, so whether you want to build with Ezekiel or any of the other tools that I mentioned, or you have like a cool idea, we'd love to have you there. Cool. So that was my talk. Um, I'm ready for any questions that, that you want that you want to ans ask me. If you do not manage to ask me a question, feel free to send me uh, a DM on Telegram at DC Build 3 r or on Twitter, or just just uh, pull me aside once I finish my talk. Um, so thank you for listening.